all, greetings on behalf of Easter Seals, and welcome to The Real Scoop on Brain Health. On today's webinar, you'll hear from two national experts about healthy aging and factors influencing brain health based on current science. My name is Lisa Peters Bumer, and I'll be taking a few minutes to make introductory remarks as well as introduce our speakers. Let me begin by thanking our operator, April, for her support. And now, some logistics for today's call. The phone lines will be muted throughout today's webinar. Should you have any questions or comments during the webinar, please use the online chat feature of our webinar software. That will be found on the left-hand side of your screen. We'll address content-related re questions towards the end of the hour once our speakers conclude their presentation. And you'll be able to do that both via the ch chat fe feature and uh, through an audio line that we'll explain at the end, at the conclusion of the presentation. This webinar is being recorded. Transcripts and the recording will be posted to easterseals.com slash brain webinar later this month. We're pleased to provide live captioning for today's webinar. To turn on this feature, click on the closed caption icon next to audio and video on the upper left section of your screen. Now I'd like to review our agenda and learn, and learn a bit about our audience before giving a brief overview of Easter Seals and introducing our esteemed presenter. During our time together today, Dr. Jane Tilly will share the National Alzheimer's Plan, plan goals as well as an exciting new brain health resource developed through a collaboration with the Administration on Community Living, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and the National Institute on Aging. Following that, Dr. David Rubin will discuss healthy aging, key factors that influence brain health, memory, and learning, potential threats to brain health, and lifestyle behaviors that can help protect brain health. We're delighted that you've logged, in, uh, logged on today, and it will be helpful to know who is with us, and specifically your reason for joining us. Please use the poll feature found on the left side of your screen okay, to check a response to the following question. Is your interest in brain health A, for yourself, B, to help a family member or friend, or C, for clients, professional interest. Again, that's for yourself, B, to help a family member or friend, or C, for clients and your professional interest. If you could please enter that. Um, on the side, and then we'll be able to have a little more information about the folks who have joined us today. Okay, it looks like most of the people that have joined us uh, have joined us uh, because their interest is uh, for clients and professional interest. Just a bit of background on Easter Seals. Easter Seals is one of the nation's largest health and human services organizations. For nearly 100 years, we've been advocating for and providing services to individuals with disabilities and special needs, including older adults and their families across the lifespan through our network of 73 affiliates and 500 service sites across the United States. Easter Seals is committed to creating a world of inclusion, health, dignity, empowerment, and independence. It has been my pleasure and privilege to be affiliated with this wonderful organization for almost 13 years now. And it is my pleasure also to take a moment and introduce today's speakers. Dr. Jane Tilly joined the Administration for Community Living in 2008. She's a team leader for brain health and dementia activities at ACL. 
She has extensive experience with research and policy analysis on a variety of health, long-term services and supports, and public benefit issues through her work at the Urban Institute and AARP's Public Policy Institute. Prior to joining the Administration for Community Living, she worked on dementia policy and practice issues for the Alzheimer's Association. Welcome, Jane. Our, our second speaker is Dr. David Rubin. Dr. Rubin is the director of the multi-campus program in geriatric medicine and gerontology and chief of the division of geriatrics at the University of California, Los Angeles Center for Health Sciences. He is the Arch Stone Foundation Chair and Professor at the David, David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA and Director of the UCLA Claude D. Pepper Older Americans Independent Center and the UCLA Alzheimer's and Dementia Care Program. He sustains professional interests in clinical care, education, research, and administrative aspects of geriatrics maintaining a clinical primary care practice of frail older persons and attending on inpatient and geriatric psychiatric units at UCLA. He has won seven awards for excellence in teaching and Dr. Rubin's bibliography includes more than 190 peer-reviewed publications in medical journals, 33 books and numerous chapters and he is the lead author of the widely distributed book geriatrics at your fingertips. Our many thanks to Dr. Tilly and Dr. Rubin for presenting today and to the organizations that supported us by getting the word out about today's webinar. I'll now turn things over to Dr. Jane Tilly. Dr. Tilly? Uh, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, I'm very pleased to talk to you about a new brain health resource that as Lisa mentioned was developed by the science agencies at the Department of Health and Human Services in the place where I work which is the Administration on Aging which is part of the new Administration for Community Living. Uh, next slide please. Uh, this new brain health resource is, um, stems from the National Alzheimer's Project Act which, is, which was um, enacted into law in 2011 and that, pro that act requires the Secretary of Health and Human Services to do five things. Uh, one is to create a national plan to overcome Alzheimer's disease. The second, and this is a very important one, is to coordinate research and services across federal agencies speed up development of treatments for the disease and improve care for those who have it now and also to improve outcomes for people at high risk of developing Alzheimer's. And as part of the National Alzheimer's Project Act, uh, the Secretary released the first, thank you, the first uh, National Alzheimer's Plan in 2012. That plan has five goals. The, we set a time frame for um, developing a treatment or prevention methods for Alzheimer's disease by 2025. We're on the beginnings of that path, but we're hoping we make progress continually on that. The second goal of the Secretary's plan is to optimize care quality and efficiency, expand supports for people with the disease and their families. The fourth goal and this is to enhance uh, public awareness and engagement around uh, dementia issues and that's what part of this brain health resource is part of. And then finally with the plan of fiscal is to track our progress and continually drive improvement towards meeting the plan's goals. Next slide. This new resource that uh, is part of the Secretary's national plan and responsive to the National Alzheimer's Project Act is called Brain Health as You Age. And what this uh, resource is designed to do is to help people learn how to reduce risks that may be related to brain health. It contains information from current research from our science agencies and I would mention that this um, resource discusses a variety of risk factors related to brain health and the strength of the evidence for those risk factors does, does vary by factor and, and Dr. Rubin will talk more about that in, in a little bit. 
we do the PowerPoint that you'll be seeing today is designed for professionals to use with lay audiences, and uh, it uses plain language so that the science that we're discussing is understandable uh, to people who aren't necessarily healthcare professionals. Next slide, please. There are four parts uh, to the Brain Health Resource. The first is the PowerPoint that Dr. Rubin will present. There's an accompanying guide for educators who uh, provide the PowerPoint, and that guide provides additional information in case there are questions from the audience. And then we have two uh, resources designed specifically for consumers. One is a fact sheet, and another is a, a resource uh, I won't call it a manual, but it's a resource that can help consumers that want more information on specific topics. Next slide. Uh, what you see here is the two-page, it's one page both sides, uh, the two-page fact sheet. And this is designed for consumers. And it talks about risk factors associated with brain health and gives some general websites where people can go for free, free resources. Next slide. This is the, um, the guide that I talked to you about. It's called Key Facts and Resources, and it covers 20 topics affecting brain health. You can see that basically the table of contents in this slide, it covers things from alcohol use to stroke. Each topic has uh, several paragraphs of background information, as well as uh, links to free resources that I've mentioned. And, um, those resources, for example, someone who is interested in, um, in quitting smoking, we give information about the free quit line that's available. And there are a lot of uh, topics, uh, you know, a variety of topics people can get more help with. Uh, next slide. Uh, finally, I just wanted to let everyone know how to get the full set, the four parts of our brain health resource. And the website is listed as www.acl.gov slash get underscore help slash brain health slash index dot ASPX. If anyone has any questions about use of the resource or any of the content, I'm happy to reply to anyone who sends me an email at jane, J-A-N-E dot Tilly, T-I-L-L-Y at A-C-L dot H-H-S dot gov. And I'm going to turn it over now to Dr. Rubin to give you the presentation that, that we developed. And I'm, we're all looking forward to hearing from you, Dr. Rubin. Great. Thank you so much. Everybody okay with hearing me? Good. Um, so, uh, as mentioned, um, this uh, is a joint effort of the ACL, National Institute of Health, and the CDC. And if I go to the next slide, please. There we go. Thank you. So, uh, aging and health, uh, it really depends upon three things. Uh, your genes, uh, which you're born with, uh, the environment, uh, kind of the uh, where you are and your lifestyle, and for each of these, uh, it really um, it really depends on uh, on what you were born and uh, and what you are doing with yourself. For example, for myself, I have very poor genes. Uh, uh, we have early death in our family, so I have to maximize both my environment and my lifestyle to try to overcome some of those genes. Uh, if you have genes that uh, your parents lived to 110, maybe you. Uh, you have something that I don't have, and, and you, you can get away with things. But for the most part, these are the three. Uh, the ones that are most influence, uh, that you can influence the most are really your healthy lifestyle choices. Uh, next slide. So uh, when we talk about aging and memory and aging and learning, uh, there are some normal changes. Uh, first of all, are, uh, difficulty finding words. Uh, this is uh, this is like things that are on the tip of your tongue. And uh, for example, if you if you want to see how how old you're getting, and, and this happens to me all the time, is if you if you travel and you and you get a little bit of jet lag, geez, you'll find your word finding difficulties uh, they just pop up. 
and those are probably previews of coming attractions because we all have difficulty finding words as we get older. We also have uh, um, more problems with multitasking, the kinds of things that kids can do very well on a computer. Um, we really have to focus more on one task at a time, finish that, and then do the next one. And there are some slight decreases in uh, attentiveness. Uh, and we tend to get a little more restless, a little quicker in terms of our attention to, uh, to tasks. On the other hand, uh, the good news is that um, you can uh, still learn new things. Uh, I, I'm at a stage in my life where uh, it's probably the third chapter of four chapters, but I, I was in, living, uh, in dread of uh, our new electronic health record, which is very complicated, and, and could I learn this or not? In fact, uh, despite some English, uh, in fact, I, I am able to learn it, and within a few months, I'm probably as good as, as the kids are. Uh, creating new memories. Uh, this is something that still happens. Uh, we lay down new memories. We uh, meet new people. We remember them. And finally, uh, increasing uh, vocabulary and language skills. Uh, in, in fact, as we get older, um, uh, we uh, have more words. Uh, who would have thought 20 years ago that we would have words like blog in our vocabulary, but indeed we know what we're talking about when we say that. Uh, one thing that's not on this uh, side, which, which I'd like to add, is one of the other things we gain as we get older is, is wisdom. And uh, that's a very important uh, feature, we, wisdom and generally uh, judgment. We've been there, done that, and kind of know how to move on. Next slide, please. So uh, we're going to go through these in, in greater detail uh, on an individual basis, but just an overview of some things that can actually um, uh, harm uh, brain health, uh, some medications or taking them uh, inappropriately, uh, smoking, excess use of alcohol, uh, health problems such as heart disease and diabetes, uh, poor diet, uh, insufficient sleep, lack of physical activity, uh, and lack of social activity. Now, as Jane mentioned, at some of these we have very good data on in terms of their risk, and some of them uh, and how modifiable that risk is, and some of them uh, are more um, from observational studies rather than clinical trials. Next slide, please. So uh, medications. Uh, medications and combinations can affect your thinking and, and the way your brain works. And here, uh, the medications kind of fall into two categories. The first are uh, over-the-counter medications, and in, in particular, um, medications that are used to help people sleep uh, are, 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 can be very bad actors here. In fact, what I tell my patients is anything that has a PM uh, on, on the uh, medication is probably something that, that can, um, can actually uh, impair your memory uh, or impair, impair your intellectual functioning. Uh, these are known side effects of these kinds of medicines, and um, um, there have been some studies that show that, that taking a medicine like a, like a Benadryl that's available over the counter can have as much effect uh, on people's uh, functioning and intellectual capacity as a drink of alcohol. Um, so, and for older people, it tends to be worse. The second big category of medications that can uh, affect your brain are, are medications that uh, are prescribed to you uh, by a physician or another provider. And here, th these are also uh, somewhat uh, dangerous, uh, particularly hypnotics, uh, medicines that are trying to um, uh, reduce anxiety, the classes of drugs like Valium and, and, and uh, those Ativan, those kind of drugs. And also we see this a lot with um, medications that are used to, tr uh, to treat uh, epilepsy or, or, or they're called sometimes mood stabilizers. And these drugs uh, almost all have, tend to have uh, sedating effects and also can uh, impair cognition. So the take home message from, from this slide is uh, number one, um, Make sure that um, when you're, you're buying medicines to treat yourself through over-the-counter types of things, home remedies, cold preparations, et cetera, like that, um, is to make sure that they don't have uh, antihistamines uh, and don't use these for, um, for sleep. Uh, the second is if you're getting started on new medications from your doctor, a good thing to ask is whether uh, this might have sedating or cognitive side effects. Next slide, please. 
Uh, smoking. Uh, smoking is, is, is bad for almost everything that you do, but in particular with brain health, uh, it is a major risk factor for uh, cerebrovascular disease. That means having strokes, and uh, strokes are the, are the second most common cause of, of dementia. Uh, after Alzheimer's disease, these many strokes, and in fact, um, uh, that that this is not only a uh, smoking is not only a cause of heart disease, but also brain disease and and cognitive function. Uh, and as mentioned here, there are free resources available to help people quit smoking. Uh, it is it is one of the best things, not always the easiest, but one of the best things you can really do for yourself uh, if you smoke is to quit. Next slide, please. Uh, alcohol. So alcohol's effect on brain health is, has been a kind of uh, a, a moving target here. Uh, there were some uh, some studies, observational studies, that showed that people who uh, drank moderate amounts of alcohol uh, were at lower risk for having um, for uh, developing later uh, Alzheimer's disease. But in fact. Um, there, this is, this is still pretty controversial. So, uh, as most people know, that the acute effects of alcohol, in other words, having a few drinks at a time, uh, impairs cognition. There's just no two ways about it. Uh, that uh, it impairs memory, it impairs judgment, uh, it impairs reflexes. Uh, this is what what causes automobile accidents when people uh, have been drinking. And uh, unfortunately, as we age. Uh, we are more sensitive to the effects of alcohol. And that's partly because of the body changes where we have uh, more fat and less uh, free water uh, distribution uh, in our bodies. This happens to everyone. Uh, so that we are more sensitive to the effects, uh, including the cognitive effects of, of alcohol uh, as we get older. Uh, the other um, effects that you see is alcohol can itself cause dementia. Uh, and indeed, uh, one of my patients who is a uh, retired physician, uh, the best thing we ever did for this guy in terms of his memory was to get him to stop drinking, and he's done very well. So uh, as it says here, staying away from alcohol can reverse some of these changes. Uh, and uh, as we get older, we really have to drink much more in uh, moderation. Uh, in addition, uh, medications, uh, particularly the medications we talked about earlier, uh, do not interact with alcohol. Uh, in fact, the, um, the, the combination uh, is especially detrimental to cognitive function. Next slide, please. Uh, so common uh, conditions that affect brain health. So these are, are medical conditions that people have, and they, they manifest in a variety of different ways. Uh, heart disease, uh, hypertension, and diabetes uh, all function on the blood vessels that go to the brain. And just as we talked about uh, earlier, uh, that uh, many strokes uh, or, or vascular disease to the brain is a very common cause of cognitive dysfunction in the long run in, in older people. And indeed, there's at least some evidence to say that by treating uh, blood pressure, by preventing heart disease, by treating diabetes, uh, that there can be some um, some preservation of a cognitive function. Um, many times this is manifested strictly through the prevention of cerebrovascular disease, though. The other, uh, the next one is, is the big uh, gorilla in, in the uh, in the show, and that that is Alzheimer's disease. Uh, Alzheimer's disease is is an epidemic. Uh, it is a disease of aging. So that the prevalence uh, when you're 65 to 74 is very low, probably about 3 percent. But among those uh, 85 years or older, it can be as much as 50 percent, which means that uh, uh, that everybody in the United States is affected by Alzheimer's disease. Uh, if you live long enough, either you'll develop it, your spouse will develop it, uh, your brother, your sister. Uh, even today's generation's parents and grandparents are developing this disease. Uh, very, very common disease. We'll talk a little bit more about it in just a couple minutes. Stroke, as we've mentioned. Uh, traumatic brain injury. This can be uh, a lifetime of trauma. One of my patients was a, uh, a boxer and developed uh, what they call dementia pugilistica, 
but uh, even uh, those who have less uh, repetitive and less uh, um, frequent um, uh, brain injuries can develop cognitive impairment as a result. Uh, depression uh, is, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about depression, it's a very uh, interesting thing because depression and cognitive impairment can be independent of each other. Uh, depression and cognitive impairment can be coexisting or cognitive impairment can, can uh, be uh, independent of uh, just progressing on its own. But this kind of different scenarios make, make it very difficult to diagnose and treat dementia, uh, depression and dementia. And finally, uh, sleep problems. We'll talk a little bit more about this in just a couple of minutes. So can I have the next slide, please? So uh, as, as mentioned, heart disease and high blood pressure can lead to stroke and blood vessel changes that uh, are what we call multi-infarct dementia or vascular dementia. And here um, we know a lot about trying to reduce this risk, uh, controlling cholesterol and hypertension. And the American Heart Association um, and the American College of Cardiology, within the past year, re-examined its, um, its goals and treatment of both high blood pressure and cholesterol. And so there are new guidelines out uh, that should, um, if followed, reduce this risk. Uh, the good news here is that we're making some um, some progress in reducing uh, heart disease and cerebrovascular disease over the past several decades. Uh, exercise, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about this later, but it uh, certainly uh, it, it prevents uh, heart disease and can lower blood pressure. Uh, eating healthy foods, uh, there's a, a lot of data uh, now on both uh, the Mediterranean diet, uh, which is uh, high in, in certain fishes and certain oils, uh, as well as what they call the, the DASH diet, which has been very effective in reducing blood pressure. Um, and, and both of these are, are uh, don't require buying special foods. Uh, they're, they're stuff that you can buy off the, off the uh, shelf at the markets. Uh, we've spoken about quitting smoking and limiting use of alcohol. Next slide, please. Diabetes. Diabetes um, causes um, both what we call macrovascular, which is the large blood vessels that go to your brain, and also microvascular, which is the small blood vessels that go into your brain. And both can be affected. Um, it uh, increases your risk for stroke and heart attack. And there is some evidence uh, that it may also predispose uh, to, uh, to Alzheimer's disease, um, blood sugars being higher, um, higher blood sugars uh, predisposing to Alzheimer's disease. Uh, for many of us, uh, the, the best way to prevent uh, diabetes uh, is to maintain uh, an ideal body weight. Um, that this is uh, largely a, a disease that um, you know, type 2 diabetes that, uh, that um, occurs mostly in uh, people who are overweight or obese uh, or some uh, older people who are, are thin, but, but most of the, um, the population who has diabetes now, and this is increasing dramatically, are those who are overweight. Uh, we know that physical activity can reduce the risk of uh, developing diabetes, and we also know that it can uh, improve blood glucose control and reduce uh, some of the consequences of diabetes. So uh, here's something where you, uh, you really need to talk with the provider about uh, lifestyle and medications uh, for diabetes uh, that work the best for you. Next slide. So Alzheimer's disease, and we talked a little bit about this. Um, Alzheimer's disease uh, is uh, one of the consequences of, of living longer. Uh, when, you, when you think about 50 or 60 years ago, when most people did not live to their 70s and 80s and 90s, uh, this was much less of, of an issue. But now that people are living uh, much longer, that, in fact, it is a very prevalent and many say an epidemic disease. The known risk factors are age, 
Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the older you are, the higher likelihood you have of developing Alzheimer's disease. And this particularly takes off uh, around the ages of 80 to 85. Uh, genes and and people ask me uh, patients ask me this a lot about it. They say their brother and their uh, father and, and their sister had Alzheimer's disease. And generally, what I ask is what what age were they when they developed the disease? Because the genetic component uh, is most important in people who develop uh, early onset uh, uh, dementia. Uh, people who uh, develop it in their 40s, 50s, and, and maybe 60s. And uh, there's been a lot of recent publicity about, uh, for example, Down syndrome. And Down syndrome um, uh, children uh, develop um, uh, Alzheimer's disease in their uh, late 30s and, and their 40s. And that's obviously very genetically linked uh, with trisomy 21. Uh, the other uh, risk we talked about earlier was head injury. And I mentioned dementia pugilistica. Let's go back, go back. There we go. So the other suspected risks uh, are heart diseases we talked about, blood pressure, uh, lack of physical activity. And this is pretty interesting because uh, it, it's held up in a number of studies that, that exercising le less really predisposes you to, uh, to developing uh, dementia in later life. Uh, depression, we talked about that, that relationship of depression and, and, uh, and dementia. And indeed, uh, we see a number of patients who present with the kind of apathy and the social withdrawal uh, that for all the world looks like depression. But over time and with further testing, what you really uh, find is that they had, in fact, early uh, dementia. So this very peculiar relationship between depression and dementia. And we talked about diabetes. Now, next slide. So where we are with Alzheimer's now, um, that basically Alzheimer's is an incurable disease. And the, the medications that we have for Alzheimer's disease are not all that powerful. Uh, they're, they're not all that great. And what they tend to do is to slow the trajectory of the decline, but they don't, uh, and the vast majority of people, don't prevent the, uh, the progression of the disease. Um, so, so by and large, uh, when people do develop Alzheimer's disease, most of the um, most of this care is focused on managing um, the complications of the disease, managing other illnesses, and and helping the caregivers, uh, helping the caregivers, and helping the, the social aspects of of uh, managing and living with this disease for a lifetime. There are some uh, some uh, promising approaches to. Uh, reducing the risk of the cognitive decline in Alzheimer's. Uh, the best of these, uh, I've recently reviewed this literature, has been exercise. And what we do know is that by exercising regularly, uh, you do reduce your risk. What is the right amount of exercise? What is the right type of exercise? Uh, and how frequently it needs to be done is still a matter of, of debate. But uh, in fact, uh, getting out and just doing it is, is, is probably the best thing you can do for yourself. A uh, healthy diet, as I alluded to, the Mediterranean, the DASH diets, uh, those all show some promise, but they've not really been evaluated yet in randomized clinical trials. Uh, similarly, controlling blood pressure, heart disease, diabetes uh, show promise largely through the, uh, the reducing the risk on cerebrovascular uh, disease and stroke. And finally, the one that, uh, that is getting a lot of attention now is cognitive uh, brain training. And I think we have another slide on that in just a moment, and I'll tell you about that. Next slide, please. So brain injury. Uh, we talked about this. Uh, in the context of uh, injuries uh, that uh, were repetitive injuries. But in fact, uh, one of the other major injuries that happens is falls. And uh, in fact, that falls are largely preventable. Uh, in another uh, aspect of my life, uh, I'm working on a very large project to try to reduce falls. But the interesting thing about it is that uh, these, um, the things that work for falls are available today. And uh, some of these are exercises, particularly Tai Chi, um, the falls prevention classes. There is something called OTAGO, O-T-A-G-O, 
Uh, and these are all CDC approved uh, recommended um, um, approaches to reducing falls. Uh, and uh, many of these are offered in the community uh, at senior centers and other um, ACL supported um, programs. Uh, making your home safe, safer, this includes re reducing, uh, removing uh, throw rugs, making sure that there's not clutter, having handrails and guardrails. And particularly this is important with people who have vision problems. Uh, medications, we refer to this. Uh, anything that can make you groggy or unsteady is going to increase your risk of falling. Uh, wearing safety belts uh, when you're in a car and helmets if you're on a bicycle uh, or a motorcycle. Uh, and uh, getting enough sleep. Next slide. So depression. Uh, depression uh, works in many ways. Uh, these are uh, True depressive symptoms are these feelings of sadness, loneliness, loss of interest, uh, difficulties with uh, sleeping, particularly early morning awakening, and sometimes trouble getting to sleep at night. And uh, it's not just a, a, a feeling blue for a day. They have to persist over time. Uh, depression is common in aging, but it is not a normal aspect of aging. Uh, you don't get depressed because you're old. Um, medications, uh, sometimes it is a side effect of uh, depression can be a side effect. And uh, because of the um, effect on mood and level of interest and being engaged, oftentimes depressive symptoms can look a lot like dementia. Uh, there can be some memory impairments with it, but things like being oriented, knowing uh, uh, where you are, what the situation is, those kind of things are very uncommon in depression, but tend to be more common, particularly in moderate or severe uh, dementia. Uh, treatment of depression, uh, the good news is that there are effective treatments. And the even better news is that uh, most patients will have a choice between therapy uh, and medications. And indeed, my patients sometimes would prefer to have um, medications that they can just take once a day and not have to go through the therapy once a week or once every two weeks. Uh, and others say, geez, I don't want to be on any medicines. I, I prefer the therapy. And they both work um, in, in mild to moderate uh, depression. Next slide, please. Sleep apnea. This is a, a disease that's increasing. And it's an unusual disease where um, basically when, when people go to sleep, uh, their tongue uh, moves a bit. It, it relaxes the muscles in the tongue, and it tends to occlude the airway. And what happens with that, if your airway is occluded uh, while you're sleeping, uh, the natural reaction is to wake up. And, and what happens is that people stop breathing, they wake up, and most of the times they get up back to sleep. But in fact, um, they haven't really had a full night's sleep. They've, they've wakened up sometimes 15, 20 times an hour. Uh, even though they don't remember having woken up. Uh, frequently their spouses will tell you they're, they're up all night waking up, uh, kind of a jerking waking up. Um, but in fact, uh, this is not a benign condition. Uh, it can lead to uh, hypertension. It can lead to stroke uh, and, and uh, some memory loss, all of which can affect brain health. Uh, treatment, uh, if people who are overweight, losing weight can help. Uh, avoiding alcohol, uh, stopping smoking. But the mainstay of treatment of this uh, are special devices. Many have heard of uh, CPAP or BiPAP. Uh, sometimes uh, if it's mild, you can use an appliance that goes in the mouth and moves the jaw forward. But in, in fact, uh, most of the treatment is, uh, are special devices. Next slide. So what can you do to protect brain health? Um, the kinds of things that you need to do are taking care of your health, uh, eating healthy foods, uh, being active. And I think it's more than just being active. It's really exercising, learning new things, and connecting with family, uh, friends, and community. Next slide. Next slide. Okay. Uh, first, uh, in terms of taking out care of your health, 
this is getting your recommended health screening. Uh, the um, um, Net U.S. Uh, Preventive Health uh, Service uh, has been very rigorous about evaluating what people should be done, what shouldn't be done, and uh, in terms of preventive care, uh, it should be a no-brainer if if the uh, U.S. Preventive Service Task Force recommends it, you should do it. Uh, managing the health conditions such as diabetes, high blood pressure, and high cholesterol. Um, being vigilant about your medications. Being vigilant. Uh, it's too easy for doctors to just prescribe. Uh, that's what we do very frequently. But it, it's incumbent upon patients to question, do I really need this medicine? Uh, what are the side effects? Uh, can we manage this condition without medications? Uh, reducing your risk of falls. Uh, quitting smoking. Next slide. Eating healthy. Uh, these are the kinds of things that you'll see in a Mediterranean diet or a DASH diet. Uh, fruits uh, and vegetables. Um, uh, one of the things that uh, didn't make it on the slide, but um, it uh, it is uh, some interesting stuff that uh, there's some recent data suggesting that nuts. Uh, eating nuts daily uh, may reduce your risk of, of heart disease and, and stroke. Whole grains, uh, if you're going to eat meat, uh, it should be lean meat uh, or, or eat fish or poultry. Uh, low fat or non-fat dairy products, uh, less solid fat, sugar and salt, and proper portion sizes. I think I'm really glad that this is included because um, we tend to uh, go to restaurants and, and think about uh, um, you know, how much you're getting, how much value you're getting, but the value is kind of measured in how big the portions are. And in fact, the uh, the food industry has has got a lot, uh, has learned about this, and they use that to attract people into their restaurants. But in fact, you don't have to eat everything on your plate. And finally, adequate fluid. Uh, there are many healthy meal programs that are provided uh, through the Area Agency on Aging. New, next slide, please. All right, get moving. So I'm going to stand on my soapbox here. And physical activity is probably the best therapy that we have for, for almost everything. It reduces the risk of diabetes, heart disease, depression, stroke. It helps prevent falls. It helps uh, with our memory. Uh, but it comes at a price. And that price is that you have to do it. You have to get off your uh, fanny and, and, and get to work. Uh, and here, um, the recommendation is about 150 minutes of exercise. This doesn't have to be uh, intense, um, but it has to be, it has to be motion. It has to be motion, and walking is a great start. Uh, many of my patients are using pedometers and with that magic number of 10,000 steps, uh, and that's a good way to start. And um, what, I, what I tell my patients and what I live by is that uh, every day, you just have to build this into your, into your day every day, is that you have an exercise time, and that exercise time is taking care of yourself. It's taking care of that body that uh, was given to you. Um, there uh, are many programs that are available in the community, uh, generally at low cost or free, to help people move smoothly and safely. And if you haven't been active, it's a good idea to talk to your doctor to see if, uh, if there's any kind of clearance that needs to be done. But for most things, such as walking, uh, by and large, you can get started with. Next slide. Keeping your mind active. So here, uh, it's it's all about uh, uh, thinking about the mind as a muscle. If you if you don't use it, you're you're, you're going to lose it. So uh, there are many ways of doing this: uh, mentally stimulating activities, reading, uh, playing games. Uh, a lot of people like to do crossword puzzles, and there's some evidence to suggest that that may be beneficial. Uh, learning new things. Uh, one of my patients is learning a new language uh, in her 70s, and what a great thing to do. Uh, taking or teaching a class, and there's there's actually some pretty interesting data now that um, that in fact uh, there are some programs in the arts, such as uh, acting classes, that may actually help uh, cognitive function. 
So uh, being a participant in these, especially if they stretch you. Uh, being uh, social through uh, work and volunteering, there's some interesting data that are coming out of something called the Experience Core, where seniors are volunteering at schools to help kids and seems to help uh, both the seniors and the children. Now, we don't have clinical trials that suggest that these are going to prevent Alzheimer's disease, but in fact, they can help with brain health. Next slide. Staying connected. And, and this is one of the things I, I tell my patients all the time uh, because I think it, it's, really, uh, it, it's really critical is that it's important at any stage of your life, particularly when you're older, uh, to, to have meaning. To have meaning, to be connected, to be connected to people, to have a purpose. And uh, indeed, uh, we, we just did some focus groups on patients who have early Alzheimer's disease. And what, the, what, what was most important to them was to have meaning in their life. And, and that's one of the things that actually promotes brain health. Um, it reduces uh, the risk for, for many things. Um, and uh, it's easy. It, it's pretty easy. What you can do is uh, uh, there are many kind of activities that are aimed at seniors. Uh, a number of these are, are through the ACL uh, or at senior centers or are basically available in the community. Next slide, please. So what can you do today? Today is, and we always think about uh, small steps here. What is the one thing you can do? And indeed, when I uh, prescribe an exercise prescription to patients, I tell them, you know, that I said the worst thing you could do is get on the bike for 45 minutes uh, or try to jog because you're going to be very sore tomorrow and that's going to end. Uh, I tell them to start with a five minute or 10 minute walk every day and then a week later go up to a, a 10 minute or a 15 minute walk every day. Uh, you can change your diet uh, pretty easily. You don't have to completely rearrange your diet. Uh, if you're overdue for health screenings, um, then uh, you can, you can uh, schedule your appointment. And um, make a list. Lists are very valuable. Lists of things you're going to do that day, including these healthy behaviors. Finally, getting support from family, friends, or community groups. I remember uh, very well with my mother-in-law uh, when, um, when she started uh, wanting to get healthy again. Uh, she talked to us, and we were, we were uh, just cheering her on. We were her cheerleaders. Next slide. So there's an abundance of information available. Uh, Jane gave uh, some uh, 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 one website uh, through ACL. Uh, there are a number of other uh, community programs through the area agencies on aging, uh, through the Aging and Disability Resource Centers, through the National Institute of Health, National Institute of Aging. Uh, you can follow what's going on uh, with research uh, for brain health through clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, and finally, uh, the CDC uh, Control and Prevention has a, a couple of good websites. And uh, they have been really very proactive in identifying what works for older people, particularly with, with falls prevention, but other, uh, other healthy behaviors as well. Next slide. Maybe the last one. So we're up to the questions and comments section. Thank you, David, um, very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rubin and, and Dr. Tilly for this, your very, very informative uh, presentation. And now we'll take the next five minutes to answer any questions that any of you in the audience may have. Um, the, the first question is, may we get a copy of the slides? And the answer is twofold. Yes, we have archived. Uh, we, we have recorded this session, and we will archive this. It will be a, available on our website um, with, uh, at the end, near the end of the month. Uh, we can send an email out to folks when it's up. Um, the slides that are the brain health resource that Dr. Rubin just um, went through are also available on the website um, for the in, uh, administration on community living. So that's a resource available to you. 
And then this webinar as a whole will be archived and available to you on our Easter Seals website. And I'll give you that link uh, shortly. Um, are there are there other questions that um, the audience has that you can either put it in the chat feature on the left hand side of your screen or you can press star 1 on your telephone keypad to ask a live audio question. That's star 1 on your telephone keypad. So I'm going to circle back to April. Our operator, are there any questions waiting on the line? There are no audio questions at this time. Okay. Thank you. Um, can, can, uh, can you please give uh, Dr. Rubin uh, or uh, Dr. Tilly, could you please give an example of a program that helps you learn to move safely? Uh, this right. is Jane. Oh, go ahead, David. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so there are several uh, CDC programs um, that uh, are CDC approved programs. One is called Otago or Otago uh, that was um, that is actually aimed at the, uh, people who are at high risk of falling, and it's been shown to reduce the risk of falls. Another is Tai Chi, and uh, Tai Chi is is uh, ancient martial art. But it, it, in fact, uh, it has been shown to reduce falls and um, and keep people moving much better. Thank you, thank you. Um, we have another question, and that is, um, how is Alzheimer's disease different from de dementia? Yes. So dementia is the umbrella term, and so if if that's the umbrella, there are many other. Uh, there are many diseases that fall under that category. So Alzheimer's disease is the largest by far, but there are others, uh, including we mentioned vascular or multi-infarct dementia. Uh, there's something called Lewy body dementia, uh, frontal temporal dementia, uh, dementia of Parkinson's disease. So there are a variety of other ones. Um, those are just the most common, but the big heading is dementia. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions um, from the audience? Uh, April, is there anyone on the audio line? Not at this time. Okay. Can you go to the next slide, please? Okay. Um, um, yes, I will go through where the slides are available. It's up on your screen now. Um, you'll have my contact information, Lisa Peters Bumer, Cheryl Ermiter, uh, my colleague here at Easter Seals, and you can see the webinar recording will be available in late September. It gives you the link, easterseals.com slash brain webinar. And we can also send um, this out to when it's up to uh, participants that joined us today. Um, and as a final question uh, before we wrap up, uh, somebody is asking, um, are there any manual activities that have been helpful in maintaining brain health? Um, so are there any manuals um, available that you're aware of uh, other than this sort of information? Uh, nothing that I have. Uh, I don't know whether the materials that were mentioned a little earlier that uh, ACL has has developed might fit the bill. Yeah, this is Jane. Um, if if there was something existing, uh, we would have probably just had a link on our website to it. There are, there are lots of different um, products being marketed out there, but in terms of of a uh, you know, a fairly simple description of um, reducing risk factors related to brain health. We do have the PowerPoint that Dr. Rubin just gave, as well as an educator's guide, which might be considered a manual, um, the consumer fact sheet and, and resource list. And those are available now um, if people go to www.acl.gov slash get underscore help slash brain health. 
slash index dot ASTX. Uh, you can download the four part um, brain health resource now. I, I do think it's a good idea, a really good idea to refer back to the um, presentation that Dr. Rubin just gave because he gave a, a really um, you know fulsome explanation of the risk factors and you know that's more nuanced than uh, what's available on the PowerPoint. Thank you, Dr. Tilly. Um, that was a great way to wrap up. Um, thank you all, uh, those of you who joined us today, and uh, just a final thank you to Dr. Tilly and Dr. Rubin for joining us and sharing their resources and expertise. We, you'll be hearing from us with a follow-up email that will contain a uh, evaluation survey, and we look forward to hearing back from you on that. Thank you so much, and have a nice day.